Greetings, my people. It's 5.49 a.m. Eastern Standard Time. March 5, 2019, I'm told. The next section in the document, entitled by Mr. Lance Owens, Joseph Smith and the Kabbalah. The next section is Joseph Smith and Kabbalah in Nauvoo. Now, of course, I've told you that over this time period, because I have different reasons for presenting this document to you, which is obviously why I haven't just thrown the document up on the screen and read it through in my wonderful way of narrating <laughs> uh, and called it a day. There's so much more to history than meets the eye. And most of you are aware of that. And I've had to become aware of that, too. There's a method for presenting history to us that didn't stop in the programming of high school and college and grad school and in the, you know, those round robin circular history books that um, all of the uh, academics who want to keep their job and comfortable lifestyles uh, vouch for and quote one another from and just love on each other throughout. That's not history. That's not a way to picture history. It's not a way to understand our day and age. I want to understand our day and age badly. So, I want to pay attention to the facets of history that I deem are far more weighty than the, the kind of historical narrative that we're taught. And here's the basic, um, here's the basic outline of, of how it's taught. We've got basically a, a number of individuals acting, for the most part, individually to, by chance, make things happen. And then somebody wrote it down, and lucky us, we get told it. That's the way history has been presented to us from the earliest age. And it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you live in America or South Africa or wherever. That's how you're taught history. So, with all the uh, various Mormon LDS resources out there, um, not only pro but con, and ones that maybe are neither pro or con, um, just objective observers, and so it's said. The unfortunate thing about most of them is that you are going to be getting either uh, an apologetic or a polemic, so either the pro or the con, concerning pretty much Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith's um, uh, possible uh, problematic uh, character and methods. Um, you're going to get individuals. You know, it, if we're talking about um, the Book of Mormon, they're going to talk about J. Smith. And, you know, they may throw in um, cowdery, but you're still going to get this very individualistic look at things. Um, Smith did this. Smith did that. I mean, some of the, the brightest... Um, uh, people that are working uh, ag against Mormonism, they they they'll they'll have organizations like, you know, is the church true, um, which is uh, uh, an inside um, Mormon uh, sort of statement. You know, is the church true? And 
apparently, you know, you're not supposed to leave LDS unless you 100% believe the church isn't true um, and 100% hate it. Um, but, um, but these people who have, who now practice in, um, you know, what they say exposing uh, Mormonism, again, they focus on either the individual, Smith, who one individual, and, you know, we've known charismatic individuals uh, in our own day and age, and we know that, that charismatic, strong uh, individuals cannot uh, begin and, and get moving and sustain the movement for such a very long time and, and have it continue to build speed even in the face of constant controversy and adversity and the messes that Smith was making without a lot of help behind him. And you know, you can, you can say it's a coincidence if you want that LDS is as uh, wealthy as it is as an institution. That's just, ah, uh, that's just their, their blessings or their good luck or whatever else. Go ahead. And you can say that it's a coincidence that LDS is so utterly pro-Zionist, uh, as I mentioned before, philo-Jewish, not philo-Semitic. Uh, Semitism, in the way that Semitism and anti-Semitism is used today, is uh, it's a misnomer, it's erroneous. Um, I asserted at the end of the last video that perhaps what we were looking at is a 15 plus million strong, it's probably much stronger than that, um, sleeper, Zionist sleeper cell. And we see that uh, throughout much of evangelicalism and definitely Judeo-Christianity because, you know, they're the ones that are allowing for all of the, uh, all of this rampant uh, crime and, and abuse of, of man uh, and humanity in general. Uh, they're allowing for this by by turning away by and 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 by embracing claims that they are utterly ignorant on they cause great harm the uh, evangelical church of today the judeo christianities uh, in all its form today are causing great harm to their own people their very own people. Most of them, of course, they don't know, but the thing is, you know, they worship men. They worship men. And if they were true disciples of the truth and the way and the life, you show the only born son of Yahweh Aliyim, they could not possibly continue this path for long without being detoured. <laughs> so, we have to look at some things. Because I just would be doing you a disservice by presenting this, this paper as, as radically different as this paper is uh, from many, you know, LDS apologetics, I would still be I would still be very um, uh, irresponsible to present it again in that accidental historic context with Joe Smith somehow being a guy who could mastermind a movement that grew in the way it did and moved in the way it did so early. And I mean physically moved as well. We, we have to consider many possible factors and and again some of them are just going to be possibilities all right but you know i've told you that it just from the earliest days i think we have to consider associations they could be 
just associations as far as, you know, Owens mentioned many friends of the family who were distinctly involved with Kabbalism, Hermeticism, witchcraft. And of course he played these things off. He mentioned this Bennett who had moved to Nauvoo in 1840 and immediately he's becoming head of this chief of that. This guy is a Mason. He was a radical Mason. He was a pervert and we don't know what else he was. But we see figures being given a certain prominence in the life of Smith since the 20s, <clears throat> 1820s and in, in his 20s. Um, but they're always played off as maybe they were playing a secondary role. And folks, we got to grow up. We have to grow up and see that, that just admit that that is, that is never the case. We know for a fact that these people who are ruling the world, they're never going to take primary roles in movements like this. My goodness, that and expose themselves. It's not the way things work. It's not the way things work. And as a matter of fact, in stark contrast to the people that are still in this Vatican uh, papal bashing, uh, it's got to be the Jesuits mindset. Now consider something. You are right to a point, but you have to grow past that point and understand why you can clearly point to those organizations, those institutions, and various peoples as being part of a problem. You have to get further in. You can't just stop where you're at. You, you can't stop at the Veith bachelor level. You have to go further than that, okay? The great controversy is far greater than Mrs. White ever made it out to be. However, um, like a current apologist for that way of thinking would say, Johnny Cerucci, when he says, yeah, well, you know what the Jesuits, every time the Jesuits got something cooking going on, they put a Jew in front of it. Okay? In contrast to that, every time these factions that I have to tell you, uh, even though it was adverse to me in my mindset a long time ago, every time I looked into it, I found somebody claiming to be Jew, as in House of Judah claim. That's what they're claiming when they say that. I found somebody like that behind it. So, you know, you have to go with the facts as you find them. And the other fact that is quite clear is every time they have something cooking, they either put a non-Jew at the front of it or just blame non-Jews, specifically white European non-Jews, for it. That has been my experience in what I've been able to uncover over and over and over and over and over and over and so many times over that it's just so uncomfortable. Because if it's true, I've got to pay attention to it. And it's true. So in that spirit, in that thought, in that line, and considering something, uh, like, for instance, what I had to bring up concerning Cain and the Keeney, and bloodlines, and part of the reason that we even have the book of Genesis, and we see various bloodlines being carried through the Old Testament, um, and we have to see them being brought through to the latter days because, as Yahweh said, he would sustain his people Judah. He would sustain his people Israel. He would bring them back together to the original land in the last days, which <laughs> ain't Palestine. And he would make them again one people. Now, this is a genetic thing. They have to have genetic markers as a people. So genes do matter. Genes do matter. If he follows down the sins of those who hate him up to ten generations, then genes matter. If he blesses those who love him and keep his word for generations, then genes matter.
if he makes it his law, before they've even come back to the land he promised, Canon, the land of Amory, that if you should marry somebody outside of the tribes of Israel, like someone from Mitzrim, or somebody from Adum, then that child cannot stand in the congregation of Israel for their prospective tribe for three generations. If they marry back in for three generations, that third generation then can stand in their tribe. This is why Caleb was of Judah, but his parentage went back to one of the sons of Adum, Edom, Esau. Because you marry back in a few generations and you're back in. This is how it was to be. Genes matter. So, with that in mind, I thought it was quite interesting that um, Joseph Smith's mother, okay, her name was Lucy Mack Smith. Her maiden name was Lucy Mack, and she was born to a man by the name of Solomon Mack. Now, I don't know the actual number of white Christians who took on the name Solomon, Saul, traditionally, for the last few centuries, but I'm willing to bet it was very few because I've known very, very few. In fact, Solomon and Abraham are usually more adopted by those who call themselves Jews. Her father's name was Solomon Mack. That is Joseph Smith's mother. I'm going to read you a small portion from, again, Henry Ford Sr.'s The International Jew. This is a brief history within this section on uh, their, uh, <clears throat> he calls it the, the gentle art of, of changing their names. Um, a brief history of it that doesn't cover all of it, but gives you the gist. He says, in 1808, Napoleon sent out a decree commanding all Jews to adopt family names. In Austria, a list of surnames was assigned to Jews. And if a Jew was unable to choose, the state chose for him. The names were devised from precious stones, as Rubenstein, precious metals such as Goldstein, Silverberg, plants, trees, and animals such as Mendelbaum, Lilienthal, Ox, Wolf, and Lo. The German Jews created surnames by the simple method of affixing a syllable, son, to the father's name, thus making Jacobson. Isaacson, while others adopted the names of the localities in which they lived. The Jew resident in Berlin became Berliner, and the Jew resident of Oppenheim became Oppenheimer. Now in the region of Schoenberg, in the German Rhine country, a settlement of Jews had lived for several generations. When the order to adopt surnames went forth, Isaac Simon, the head of the settlement, chose the name Schoenberg. It signifies in German, beautiful hill. It is very easily Frenchified into Belmont, which also means beautiful hill or mountain. A Columbia University professor once tried to make it appear that the Belmonts originated in the Belmontes family of Portugal, but found it impossible to harmonize this theory with the Schoenberg facts. So, just a little bit of a history, and I can say this, because he does iterate this later on. There is a real issue in the fact that we can trace certain names pretty easily. Uh, the problem is that there have been so many um, self-proclaimed Jews who have changed their names to Anglo-Saxon Germanic names that are so misleading, like Douglas, for instance, Michael Douglas, uh, and Kirk Douglas. They're, they're so misleading um, that you would have no idea 
And so now we have to start paying attention to uh, their features and their associations and their parentage and how easily they get in certain doors and so on and so forth and their personage and so on and so forth and folks I would say that this is one of the best possible reasons for the family Bible in which you take the time to write the family tree in and I'm telling you that that is one thing that within the course of my life before it's over I would very much like to tree out my family as much as I can um, and trace back lineage as much as I can um, because for one thing that you know to this day they are adopting names more and more Germanicized anglicized and and really getting getting one over on people and it's like Henry Ford said well look if they just didn't like their Jewish name then pick another Jewish name but you are clearly deceiving people and you will understand this if you read or you can listen to the International Jew. A number of people have done it, including, um, oh, I want to say his name is Ted. I want to say his name is Ted Wilburn, or um, he is on uh, Radio Arian. Um, and he has done a ton of shows that are pretty much readings from the International Jew with some commentary. He doesn't do the kind of commentary I do. Uh, we do something different, that's all. Um, but yeah, definitely check that out. And Radio Arian has a number of, of actually very informative uh, hosts on it. I, I would definitely say that's where a lot of, that's where a lot of people that are trying to, to broadcast in the, in the vein of, of what I and others are trying to do. That's, that's where we're having to go is is these these sources that have been started like radio arian um i think something truth truth something radio not don't not truth frequency um but uh you know euro folk that were having to migrate there because of obviously what youtube has, has done so he actually goes to the jewish encyclopedia then he says the Jewish Encyclopedia contains interesting information on this matter of its derivatives because they have many derivatives in there. And I would imagine that that would be one reason why it would be difficult to get an unredacted copy of the Jewish Encyclopedia. So, as he goes down, he gets to M. He says, Moses becomes Moritz, Moss, Mortimer, Max, Mac, Moskin, Mose. Now, does that prove that Joseph Smith's mother, Lucy Mack, was a Jew? No. Doesn't prove that. Okay, so certain names either get adopted, anglicized, um, phonetically uh, changed around, you know, somebody who was uh, instantly uh, horrified at, at these, connect these dots I'm connecting could say something like, well, look at your name, Mactimus. Well, what if, what if the prefix of Mactimus uh, came from this? Um, I would say that it was far less likely since they're actually saying that the etymology from what would have been surnamed as Moses or probably Ben Moses would have gone into Moritz, Motz, Motor, Max, Mac, Mosk, and Moss. Um, f my name mocked first off the makes, so it has a sense of makes in the in the in the way of energy or calories. That's why mocked is also used as power as energy. You know to make mocked, uh, and then the e m e s part. We've actually we looked so long and hard for that, and so it turns out. One thing that I don't know more about Germany and Germanics in that whole area is because there were so many actually tribes of Germanics that lived in what we would call Germany now that spoke variations of that language. And EMES, they say, was one of the old, they will call it now a um, just an antiquated dead Scandinavian way of saying the son of, mocked. There you go. 
So, hey, putting it out there. Um, I would honestly think, like, if my name, I would say this, if, if my name were Mac or Max, I would be looking into what the root of it was. Um, to be perfectly honest with you, I'd like to think that I am so honest in my pursuit for the truth, and I mean, I'm not trying to sell you. Um, don't trust the things I say. Always check them. But that's one thing, you know, I have a lot of weaknesses. And, you know, I expose a lot of my weaknesses. But, you know, you still have to be able to affirm your strengths. And one of my strengths has been an absolute love of passionate, pure truth. It is the reason I could not exist as a man without understanding the world around me. I became a drug addict for many, many, many years, and before that, a, a pervert and a hedonist, uh, because there was something wrong with the world around me. There was something wrong with the way I understood it, perceived it, and interacted with it. And what was wrong with it was I had no truth. So all I want is the truth. If I found out that I was amongst these people that that make this claim, well, then I would broadcast that. And I would become, I am sure, one of the greatest, well, they, the, the people that they would call self-hating Jews, which are not. Because there are people out there that, that do, that, that have published or, or speak widely against this, this organized Jewry, against Talmudism, against their tribalism, their nepotism. There are. Uh, many of them, I believe, are, are actually working for them and controlling the opposition. But not all. Not all. There are individuals. Remember there are individuals. Okay? Um, Caleb's grandfather came from somewhere. He came from Edom. Adon. Um, Rahab was a Kanoni. Ruth was a Moabite. Keep this in mind. Keep this in mind. The man who Dud, David, sent to his death because Dud had lusted after his wife and took to having sex with his wife, the man who was so faithful that he would not come back and lay with his wife was a Hathi, who they erroneously call Hittite. Keep that in mind. I am not painting a people as, you know, from top to bottom, utterly, you know, incapable of, uh, come on. But that's the way they'd like it to seem, that people like myself are doing that. We're not. We're trying to get to the bottom of history and the truth and who we all are and what is going on. Because, you know, even though I would like, I would love to, I would love for all of these people who keep saying that Jesus is, is coming back uh, any moment in, you know, whether they believe in rapture or whether they believe that that is just, you know, the end all be all and that's the second coming, he's going to straighten things out. Folks, Psalm 110, verse 1, most repeated verse in the New Testament and I'll give you the regular King James translation. The Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies the footstool of your feet. Until is the key word. And believe me, I, I'm more than ready. I'm past ready for him to do that. But the problem is, that is not what I clearly see happening prophetically. The Father is going to do many things in this world, in us and through us. If we submit to his will, he's going to have his will, whether we submit to it or not, so I would suggest doing that. And then when he has accomplished his will and the restoration, that's why I'm a restorationist, I'm not a revisionist. 
They've already revised it on us, the criminals. We have to restore. We're restorationists. I'm a restorationist. So, I want to see these things occur. I want restoration of the truth, the facts, the goodness, the life. I want a restoration. I want all of us following our Lord, King, Savior, Yosho. Restoration. That's what I'm all about. Restoration. Now, I would suggest that everybody gets this copy of the International Jew and definitely reads that part on names and then starts wondering some things about names involved in other religious movements from the early 1800s and how, boy, they kept their steam and they kept things going and now, boy, that, that sect of... Uh, Claiming Christianity is doing really good financially and um, build a lot of hospitals, do a lot of missions work, never go jaywalking, never personally, never in a sermon, no jaywalking allowed. That's something to always keep in mind with these movements. No jaywalking allowed. Now, I could talk at length, you know this, about events that happened before Nauvoo. Um, I think that, I think that it, a lot of things that happened in um, Kirtland were very important, very important to look at. But I'm not going to. I am going to give you a quick run through of the Kani and then start right in on the rest of Owen's apologetic. Okay, th this is just a quick reference to what I gave you yesterday concerning how the Jews have a history of not being able to farm the land. And then I read you from Genesis 4 and Keen's curse with the land. And then I told you, you can see the Kini, who are his descendants, and they are often translated as Kenite, a terrible translation, to throw you off the scent. You have to wonder why so many words, when they were brought into English, <clears throat> and we can, we, can, we can dispense with the Masoretic for now, and just say when they were put into English, even though the Masoretic first... Uh, began to mispronounce all of these names and these words, but the English as well. They could see in the Masoretic lettering Q-Y-N-Y, Kini, Kenite, or they just could have put Kainite. I mean, they spell his name C-A-I-N, Cain. They could have put C-A-I-N-I-T-E, Kainite, okay? Not Kenite, or they could have called him Ken. But then that would have been confusing with what they call Cohen, which is actually Ken. It's, it's terrible, folks. So, if you punch in Strong's uh, H7017, you will get a relatively brief list of the Kini. First, in Genesis 15, when Abram was relatively new in the land, and Yahweh promised Abram, that his seed would inherit the land from the Parath to the river of Mitzrim, the Ner Mitzrim. And it says that among those people who were living in the land when Yahweh first promised this to Abram, our father, were the Kini, amongst others. Now, we see them again in Numbers 24. This is where Balaam, the prophet who went seeking after gain, goes to the high mountain for Balak, who was the king of Moab at the time, and Balaam <laughs> has to prophesy all the words of Yahweh. And in Numbers 24, 21, and 22, he says, He looked on the Kinim and took up his parable and said, Strong is thy dwelling place and thou puttest thy neck nest in a rock. Nevertheless, Keen shall be wasted until Ashur shall carry thee away captive. 
Now, the translative wording is deplorable. However, one thing you should take away from that is that the Kini would be carried away by Ashur at some point. Who else was carried away by Ashur at some point? Maybe many of our Israelite brethren. And maybe, since they were both carried away by Ashur, they were both planted in similar regions and continue to grow up together in similar ways. Or perhaps they were planted far away and became involved and mixed with other peoples like they did with the Omlaki because we can see their mixing with the Omlaki. As a matter of fact, we can see it quite clearly when we get into Samuel and the first king of Israel, Shaul, said unto the Kini, Go depart, get you down from among the Omlaki, lest I destroy you with them. For ye shewed kindness to the children of Israel when they came out of Mitzrim. So the Kini departed from the Omlaki. Omlak, grandson of Oshu, Esau, who is Edom, Adum, they were the first nation to attack Israel when we came out of Mitzrim. And Yahweh said to Aaron and Masha to write down what had happened and commit it to memory because he would wipe out the memory of Omlek under heaven. He didn't say he was going to wipe out Omlek. He was going to erase their memory. So he told them to memorize it. You see, Samuel memorized it. This is why Shaul didn't. And this is why he did not kill Agag. And Samuel did. Because Samuel knew. Because Yahweh said, I will have war with Omlek from generation to generation. The Kini mixed with the Omleki. The Omlaki were Adumi from Oshu Esau. Genesis is vitally important. And there are more passages. <clears throat> One that you can actually, uh, you can follow the strands from this down even further. It's First Chronicles 2.55 and the families of the scribes which dwelt at Yebez, the Tirathites, the Shimeathites, and the Sukathites. Those are terrible transliterations. These are the Kini that came from Hamath, the father of the house of Rechab. And you can follow that strain too. Just so you know that I never even advance a theory in my videos without having substantial backing. So on to Owen's article, Joseph Smith and Kabbalah in Nauvoo. By 1842, Joseph Smith most likely had touched the subject of Kabbalah in several ways and versions, even if such contacts remain beyond easy documentation. During Joseph's final years in Nauvoo, however, his connection with Kabbalah becomes more concrete. In the spring of 1841, there apparently arrived in Nauvoo an extraordinary library of Kabbalistic writings belonging to a European Jew and convert to Mormonism, who evidently knew Kabbalah and its principal written works. This man, Alexander Nybauer, would soon become the prophet's friend and companion. Go figure. Now, I looked all over in the International Jew and could not find this, so any of you who know its name, or where I can find it, or you can post a link, and uh, if you post a link in your comment, uh, YouTube might eat it and put it in a um, uh, an extras folder for me, and then I have to okay it, but I will. Uh, I check that folder at least every few days. Um, if you can find this letter, because I've been looking for it and I've been asking around for it, but nobody's been getting back to me. It is a letter that I'm going to paraphrase between some Jews from Spain and some Jews from Italy. When the Jews were getting heat in Spain, 
and they were thinking they were a lot of them were going to get out of there and they were getting heat because of their predatory practices in Spain this is around 6 uh, for, uh, 1400 Spain happened again 1600s um so this should have been pre-Columbus what it was was uh, a correspondence between these two men of of some import and influence where the one uh said to the other concerning what they were going to be doing that it, it really wasn't expedient in fact um, for them to continue in the state that they had as this uh, these self-identified Jews and uh, keeping themselves so clearly uh, separated from the host populations that would take them in and allow them to flourish and treat them quite decently. It was not good to stay so overtly separate as they had, but what they were to do now is to begin a much more strategic warfare on the peoples and countries who took them in, gave them home and shelter. They were to become the doctors, the lawyers, the clergy, the advisors to important people, um, the physicians of royalty. Um, they were to occupy all of these important and prominent offices specifically. There's, it's, it's not an accident that you hear almost, you know, every Jewish family, I, you know, I just, we just want a son to become a nice doctor. You know, he's grow up to be a nice doctor, a nice lawyer, you know, a nice rabbi. Well, not rabbi. We'll see. Well, they become the Christian clergy in many, many instances. It's not a mistake that the Murano, known as Yenego Lopez, became the founder of the Jesuits. Now, he continues... Nyboward received little detailed study by Mormon historians, and his knowledge of Kabbalah had earned only an occasional passing footnote in Mormon historical work. Nyboward was born in Alsace-Lorraine in 1808, but during his later childhood the family apparently returned to their original home in eastern Prussia, now part of Poland. His father, Nathan Nyboward, was a physician and dentist who, family sources claim, was a personal physician to the Napoleon Bonaparte and whose skill as a linguist made him of, quote, great value to Napoleon as an interpreter, claims perhaps inflated by posterity. Like his father, Alexander became fluent in several languages, including French, German, Hebrew, and later English. He also read Latin and Greek. Family tradition claims that as the first child and eldest son, his father wished him to become a rabbi, and that the young Nybauer was began, had began ra rabbinical training. However, at age 17, he insist, instead entered the University of Berlin to study dentistry and completed his studies around 1828. See here, folks, this is where I don't see it as accidental history. Uh, Nybauer's father, who is purported to be a personal, one of the personal physicians to Napoleon Bonaparte, the Napoleon Bonaparte, and a man of some great influence in those circles. Remember, we're talking about the late 1700s. There had been many centuries, well, at least a century or two, for this plan articulated in this letter that I just spoke of to be put into effect. And there is a system now going. And they say, well, he wanted him to enter rabbinical training, but instead he went into dentistry. No, uh, you know, I personally believe that there was factors. There are factors. And these people, they they're not just letting their children go willy-nilly into whatever they feel like going into, okay? You're in the tribe, and these people are obviously close to very powerful people. You're not going to go wherever you want. You're not going to get whatever education you want. You're not going to float on the wind because he would be cut off. Now, he says sometime shortly afterwards, he converted to Christianity and migrated to Preston, England. There he established a dental practice and married in 1833. In midsummer 1837, Eber 
C. Kimball, Orson Hyde, and Joseph Fielding arrived in Preston. Niebauer had been troubled by several dreams about a mysterious book, and his first question for Joseph Smith's apostles was whether they had a book for him, which of course they did. He was baptized with his family the next spring. On the 5th of February, 1841, they departed for Nauvoo, arriving in Quincy, Illinois, on the 17th of April. Four days later, Niebauer met Joseph Smith, and on the 26th of April, he notes in his journal, quote, went to work for J. Smith, unquote. Two days later, he acquired a quarter-acre lot in Nauvoo, and on the 1st of June, moved his family into their newly complete Nauvoo home, on Water Street, a few blocks from Joseph Smith's residence. Folks, you can, <clears throat> you are free to believe whatever you want. You can believe that this son of the man purported to be a personal physician to Napoleon Bonaparte, a man who spoke a half dozen languages. A man who went and was educated in the medical arts. A man who was obviously from a prominent old world Jewish family, and that would be the only way his father uh, was in the position that he was in. A man with an extensive Kabbalistic library. He has a dream. He has a dream about a book. And then wouldn't you know it, J. Smith's apostles show up and he asks him about the book and we're off to the races. You can believe that. You can believe whatever you want. You're free. So you think. <sighs> now, Owens continues, where and how Nybauer first came in contact with Kabbalah remains a mystery. Though a careful evaluation of his history and personal travels offers a few hints. Given his father's position, his childhood in western Poland, his studies in Berlin, and his subsequent conversion to Christianity, some contact with a reservoir of Kabbalistic knowledge among Sabbatean or Frankist Jews should be considered. <laughs> beep, 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 beep. Yeah. I think it's a little bit more than considered. <clears throat> how and where, how and where Niebauer first came in contact with Kabbalah, because, you know, it comes from a, a powerful old old world Jewish family, but you know, well, we're not quite sure how and where he maybe came first in contact with Kabbalah. <sighs> if he did indeed undertake rabbinical studies in Poland prior to his university education, he could not have avoided some exposure to the subject. That Nybauer brought a knowledge of Kabbalah to Nauvoo had been mentioned in several studies of the period. For instance, Newell and Avery Note in their biography of Emma Smith, quote, through Alexander Nybauer, Joseph Smith had access to ancient Jewish rites called Kabbalism. At the same time, he claimed to be translating the papyri from the Egyptian mummies, which became his Book of Abraham. That's interesting. Now, <clears throat> first off, that's misleading, because we already see that he had to have a knowledge, Joe Smith. He had to have a knowledge, a working knowledge of Kabbalah. They had these Kabbalistic um, parchments, the dagger, the talisman, and if you had Hebrew on anything back at that day, it was going to be coming from sources like that, the Kabbalah and the Talmud. Whether or not you want to or how much you want to make out of what I just illustrated earlier with his mother's maiden name. I continue. He continues that he not only knew something of Kabbalah, but apparently possessed a collection of original Jewish Kabbalistic works in Nauvoo, is, however, documented in material almost totally overlooked by Mormon historians. Why? Yeah. Um... And, he, you know, Owens plays this to the bone. I got to hand it to him, you know, because it's very convincing how he, in one way, is, is acting as if he is critiquing Mormon historians, whereas 
all of this is really is is just something to try to uh, it's damage control for the more and more and more and more and more that's coming out uh, about Smith and and I would say I I wish more about his associations with these things. In June 1843, Nybauer published in Times and Seasons a short piece entitled The Jews. The work ran in two installments, in the issue of 1st June and 15 June. As to why he wrote this piece, he states only that his effort was inspired by a talk he had heard Joseph Smith present. His essay deals ostensibly with the concept of resurrection held by the Jews. What he discusses for the most part is, however, the Kabbalistic concept of Gilgul, the transmigration and rebirth of souls. The essay is interesting not because of his comments on resurrection, but because of his repeated citations of classic Jewish Kabbalistic texts. In the course of his four-page piece, Nybauer cites over two dozen texts and authors. Of the citations, I have been able to identify at least ten are to Kabbalistic authors or works. The tone of the entire piece and the authoritative use of Kabbalistic materials suggest Nybauer's respect for Kabbalah. I would certainly say so. And... Um, yeah, you know, I would think anybody who was of the mind could very easily, as he said that Samson did, and who knows how far the, that Samson got into it. There have been other names he's mentioned that I can tell Owens has uh, either contempt for or fear for their work that he has mentioned in here. I think Quinn was one, Quinn or Quincy. Um, it wouldn't be all that hard to draw all of these parallels from Kabbalah, Talmud, you know, to concepts written down and canonized as Mormon literature. Um, why more aren't doing it? I don't know. Uh, why that man who 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 runs that uh, or who who did uh, called the I believe the heart of the matter. He never goes in to these kinds of things because, as I said, it's just, it's because of how uh, subtle the programming is in, in LDS Mormonism, um, this Judeo, um, this Philo Judaic undertone that unfortunately leads so many people, they go out of Mormonism and they just stay within the realms of. Judeo Christianity. Um, this isn't to attack, point fingers at them. This is to absolutely point fingers at the source. This is the reason. Guys, I spent years in this mindset. Back when my life was first was first seriously altered by Aralian. And you know, I got down on my knees alone one night, and I was much younger than I am today. And my road took many horrible, tragic, dark turns since then. But it was the first time that, you know, I got down and I acknowledged that I wanted a Savior, I needed a Savior, that I believed that Jesus was that Savior, and I wanted Him to save me. And shortly after that, I got baptized as a, an act of obedience, because I saw there it is right in the Bible. You know, you have a uh, profession of faith, and you're baptized. And, you know, from that point forward, I had influences that were, were very near to me that were heavily, heavily Judeo influences. And between them and what standard... Uh, more covert Judeo influences there are in most forms of evangelicalism, I had a rough road for a very long time. Uh, I had a marriage that did not work out because I was utterly lost. Guys, utterly lost. I can't tell you um, how lost I was. That's, that's how lost. I don't even know that guy that existed then. I don't. I don't think I could get through to him. But what I'm saying is, I understand. 
I understand that there is this subtle and insidious and deliberate um, Judaizing of all pertinent aspects of our faith and practice. And if all we're going to do is leave the LDS church and stick the blinders on and stick the cotton in the ears and say, well, all I needed to do was leave them, but I'm cool with all of these other things I believe. I'm sure that all of their, their the subtler parts of their doctrine didn't infiltrate my mind and my heart. I'm good. Well, I don't think you're going to grow. Not quickly. And I think that, that there's going to be hard times and confusing times for you ahead if that's your your road. And it doesn't work just with LDS. It works with darn near any denomination out there because these schisms were deliberate. They've been implanting these kinds of thoughts since the earliest days. And even though Owens is doing his best to write a, a very uh, talented apologetic there's, he has to admit all of these things as well. Okay, so there are three paragraphs left in this section. I will read all three. They are very important. Joseph Smith and Alexander Nybauer were frequent associates. Nybauer had been engaged by Joseph Smith a few days after his arrival in Nauvoo in April 1841. During the last months of the prophet's life, both his and Nybauer's diaries indicate that Nybauer read with and tutored Smith in Hebrew and German. Given his friendly relationship, the interests of the prophet and the background of Nybauer, and perhaps even the books in Nybauer's library, huh, perhaps, huh, it seems inconceivable that discussions of Kabbalah did not take place. Kabbalah was the mystical tradition of Judaism, the tradition which claimed to be custodian of the secrets God revealed to Adam. These secrets were occultly conveyed by the oral tradition of Kabbalah throughout the ages, so it was claimed, until finally finding written expression in the Zohar and the commentaries of the medieval Kabbalists, books Nybauer possessed. Kabbalah was the custodian of an occult rereading of Genesis and the traditions of Enoch. It contained the secrets of Moses and it was a subject that Joseph Smith had probably already crossed in different versions several times in his life. Can anyone familiar with the history and personality of Joseph Smith, the prophet who restored the secret knowledge and rituals conveyed to Adam, translated the works of Abraham, Enoch, and Moses, and retranslated Genesis, question that he would have been interested in the original version of this Jewish occult tradition? And here, in Nybauer, was a man who could share a version of that knowledge with him. How convenient. Some would call it providence. I would call it purposeful, planned. Whatever the reasons, he continues, for the similarities, it should be remembered that the hermetic Kabbalistic worldview parallels Joseph's vision of God in many particulars. Not only might Joseph have been interested in this material, but he would have noted how similar this sacred secret tradition was with his own restoration of ancient truth. And perhaps Nybauer, on a religious quest from Judaism and Kabbalah, Europe and England, to Christianity and Mormonism, and a new home in Nauvoo, saw or even amplified that intrinsic sympathy in his explications of the tradition for Joseph. Certainly the first text Joseph Smith would have confronted was the Zohar, the great heart of the Kabbalah. This is one of the works Nybauer cited repeatedly in his article and, as the central text of Kabbalah, is the key book any individual with Kabbalistic interests would have preserved in his library. Familiarity with the Zohar was a given for the Kabbalist, particularly one with knowledge of works as divergent as those cited by Nybauer, all of which expounded in some degree upon themes of the Zohar. 
If Niebauer had read to Joseph from any single text or explained Kabbalistic concepts contained in a principal book, the Zohar would have been the book with which to start. This might explain why in 1844 Smith, in what may be his single greatest discourse and in the most important public statement of his theosophical vision, theosophical vision, apparently quotes almost word for word from the first section of the Zohar. <clears throat> now that concludes that section of his, and uh, yeah, as he said, Owens, Lance, that he he's going to chalk all of this up to just being archetypes. So if he's going to equate what Smith is accredited with, translating, conceiving, and teaching, if he's going to equate that with core principles expressed in Kabbalah, Hermeticism, alchemy, the Enlightenment, Rosicrucianism, Masonry, as expressing similar intrinsically truthful archetypes, then this man, Lance Owens, is saying that Kabbalah, Hermeticism, all that followed to today's Masonry, which it's not even arguable that Smith was a Mason. Come on, it's not even arguable. You recall that quote? I don't know, it was about two, three videos ago, where that author had said that Freemasonry was the hardware and Kabbalah was the software of that hardware. All the symbols of Masonry are Kabbalistic. So they have their army of, I know this is harsh, I know, because there's people in it, I get it, but it's, you know what, it is evil. It is an enemy to its own people, this institution. So you have an army of these Masonic, cowardly people. who are being ruled by and steered by these Kabbalistic Jews. And no, I'm not just going to say Kabbalists and leave you thinking of Madonna. No. Jews specifically are race-oriented. They specifically are race-oriented. And since they have the power they have, they are able to openly print in their magazines, their periodicals, that you should get extensive DNA testing done if you were a Jew to see how pure your seed line is. So in light of that understanding that there are so many of my own people that are They're lost in these organizations where they've, just by way of ignorance or weakness or whatever it is. You know, and it doesn't always have to be one of those negative things. Whatever it is, you know, it's certainly not the following of the only true living Aliyim, God, and his Mashiach, Christ that has brought them there. But, you know, as a direct correlation to the fact that I don't like, like others who would practice in LDS polemics or who would um, spend great deals of time, you know, exposing Masons or, or railing against the Roman Catholic or whatever. 
I have a distinct love for my people, and I have a people type. And I'm going to read you some words from a man they called Paul, Shaul, when he says in Romans 11.1, 1, I asked then, did Yahweh reject his people? May it never be. For I also am an Israelite, a descendant of Abraham of the tribe of Benjamin. Yahweh did not reject his people, which he foreknew. Or don't you know what the scripture says about Elijah, how he pleads with God against Israel? Quote, Yahweh, they have killed your prophets, and they've broken down your altars, and I'm left alone, and they seek my life. But how does Yahweh answer him? Quote, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to Baal, or Baal. Even so, then at this present time also, there is a remnant according to the election of grace. Even then. And if by grace, then it's no longer of works, otherwise grace is no longer grace. But if it is of works, it is no longer grace, otherwise work is no longer work. What then? That which Israel seeks for, as a nation, fully, Israel seeks for? That he didn't obtain, but the chosen ones obtained it, and the rest were hardened? Who are these chosen ones? He's talking about somebody completely different? Or if you go a few verses back, is he talking about those who were elect? Just as he said within Israel, the elect, I have reserved for myself 7,000 men who have not bowed the knee to bowl. Those within them, you see. So that which corporately it sought for, he didn't obtain. Israel as a corporate. Twelve, the thirteen tribes. But the chosen ones obtained it, the rest were hardened. According as it is written, 13 tribes, because Joseph got a double portion, right? Manasseh and Ephraim. According to its written, God gave them a spirit of stupor, eyes that they should not see, ears that they should not hear, to this very day. David says, let their table be made a snare and a trap, a stumbling block, a retribution to them. Let their eyes be darkened, that they may not see, always keep their backs bent. Now, folks, I used to think that when I read this, I used to think that what he was doing was that Paul was saying that Israel, as a nation, had been, in a sense, they had been cast off so that all of these other um, racial types or ethnos whatever because there's a serious problem with us trying to deal with the, the ethnos of the new and the goyim of the old okay but, but i used to think that what that meant was this sort of replacement theology which the catholic church teaches somebody's blowing up my phone here if you're hearing all those i'm sorry um i used to think that that was that was the way that it was this replacement theology however um, I don't think that anymore, but I have not fully made up my mind what we're looking at specifically as far as the personal salvation idea with the corporate salvation idea, because those are two, those are two different concepts that I think have to be weighed in the full light of, of the full understanding of scripture. We just have to do our best at that. But there was a passage that I used to use actually to prove that and it comes up right after this where he says i asked then did they stumble that they might fall well may it never be but by their fall salvation has come to ethnos i'm gonna have to put this into uh kjv plus so that i can illustrate this right here 1484 ethnos for to provoke them to jealousy. Now, if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them the riches of the ethnos, how much more their fullness? For I speak to you ethnos, inasmuch as I am an apostle of the ethnos. 
I magnify my office. So Paul, speaking at his time, saying that there was such a very tiny, minute remnant of Israel, that they were still there, and they were still held, and that they were actually going to be held for a great renewal. He says, if them falling off to a point where they were very, very minute at that time, um, as far as who the faithful and the elect among them were, if you think that works greatly to your advantage, how much to your advantage do you think it's going to work to you and the whole world when they are redeemed corporately? This is why Israel, the true Israel, is gaining an understanding of who we are in these last days. All the evidence is there. All the promises are there in the Word. The great controversy, Mrs. White, is there. But a different controversy. Now, something to keep in mind. We could, we could argue about it a lot, but I would say that, as for right now, I think that Ethnos and Guy or Guyim are extremely close parallels. They are extraordinarily close parallels and are used the same contextually. If we look in Genesis 10 and we see that Ham, Shem, and Japheth, as they're translated, their uh, children and grandchildren and on out, um, that's what we're mostly going to see in, in Genesis 10. And one thing that you need to note in Genesis 10 is Goyim. By these, and this was speaking first off of the uh, children of Japheth, by these were the Ayim, and that's its own interesting little thing, the Isles of the Goyim divided in their lands after his tongue, his families, their nations. Because there were once many of us that came from one parentage, Na, Noah, who spread out vastly around the whole earth. And that's why there is all of this ubiquitous archaeology, architecture, artifacts, um, temples, structures, earthworks, philosophy, statues, amazing works done throughout the entire world because one people type fanned out over the face of the earth and carried these things to all the corners of the earth. And then Israel at a point was fanned out to all the corners of the earth. And they would, over a long period of time, come to prove all of those prophecies that Yahweh gave to our earliest of fathers concerning nations coming from us and kings coming from us and how plentiful we would become and how we would ha inhabit all of these corners and how in the last days he would bring all of the tribes together into one land, our land, at the end and that he would accomplish great things when Gog of Magog, the chief prince of Meshach and Thabal, would bring his hordes after hordes after hordes of various peoples around the earth to try to destroy us. Well, good news is that not only does Yahweh triumph, he fully converts his people in these last days corporately. You see, Yusho, he came to redeem us. Many on an individual basis, and especially early on. And I think that there were even things that the apostles didn't 
didn't grasp early on how everything was to play out. But of course, we, we knew, they knew, Peter even knew. His apostles asked him before he ascended, is it now that the Father is going to restore the kingdom to Israel? Is it now, is now the time when Israel will be redeemed? Not just people of, but Israel, corporately as a whole, will be redeemed. And he says, it's not for you to know these times. You, you do as you are to do what you are instructed. But now the time is close at hand. And that's why we see all the things that we're seeing. So at that, I will wrap. And um, my throat's feeling better today. And uh, it was a little bit, a little bit nicer <coughs> kind of moment, or not moment, but uh, more morning of clarity. So it was good to make a video and uh, to spend time with you all. Uh, I hope you are very well and uh, see you soon.